Okay. Good evening, everyone. Hello. My name is Karen Tucker, and I'm proud to be the CEO and a board member at the Churchill Club. Welcome to tonight's program, which is called Technology and Education, How Will It Change the Game? I would like to welcome our speakers, Linda Birch, Ben Chun, Anthony Salcito, Noah Wardrop fruin and actually on the end, and then Lucian Patel from Game Desk, and Tony Wan from Ed Surge. Welcome, thank you very much for being here. And our thanks also goes to Microsoft for their partnership and sponsorship, which we appreciate very much, and um, Luxembourg Trade and Investment Office for their, their sponsorship as well. And your sponsorship did indeed make this program possible, so thank you very much. Technology and education is obviously a huge topic, and it will definitely remain so in the times ahead. We really appreciate that we have some of the best and brightest who are passionately interested in this topic and the future of this topic here in the audience. So thank you for being here as well. We hope that you will also join us for our next program, which is one of our most popular annual programs of the year. It's called the Top 10 Tech Trends. And we're going to have five venture capitalists that are quite well known and quite successful sticking their necks out to make some predictions about what they believe is not obvious today, but we'll see explosive growth in about five years' time. And then for details about this and other programs or how you can personally get involved, more involved with the Churchill Club, you can always find those details at churchillclub.org. If you are tweeting, and we hope you do, please use hashtag Churchill Club, and you'll find other Twitter codes in your printed program. And one last thing. The conversation that we're holding tonight is for you. So if there are topics that do not come up on the stage, please ask for the microphone during audience Q&A, and that's going to be approximately the last 30 minutes of the program, and ask the question. So let me now introduce our moderator, Tony Wan. Tony is associate editor at EdSurge, and he's also co-founder of Lucky Bird Games, which I have a feeling just might be what he's working on into the wee hours tonight. And in a past lifetime, he focused on history of minority education in China, and his studies took him to Inner Mongolia. During the day, he taught proper English in classrooms, and this was a planned activity. But at night, unplanned, he taught basically gamer slang at PC cafes. And he's very passionate and thoughtful about the potential and the challenges of tech and education, and he is uh, very interested in making sure that we have we take a balanced point of view tonight. So let's welcome Tony Wan. Thanks, Karen. It's an honor to be here. And to the audience, thank you for showing up. And as Karen mentioned, I'm the associate editor of EdSurge. And just a very quick plug, if you've never heard of EdSurge before, we cover the news and information for everything EdTech uh, with a focus on connecting entrepreneurs and educators. And so gaming, of course, is a topic that often comes up in the course of my work. And it's also something that's very close to my heart. If you haven't already figured out from my physique and my thick glasses, I, I used to be a gamer. So, and, and for the record, my favorite game is Final Fantasy VII. Um, but you know, I don't also ga I, don't, I don't game just you know just because for it's fun. Um, I also realize as I, as I grow older and make the transition from college to post-college and to this thing we call the, the adult world, that a lot of the life skills and the life hacks that I employ on a day-to-day -day basis actually have the roots through my gaming days. And of course, I didn't know this as a kid, but um, it's only now that I'm starting to realize this, and anyone who tells you otherwise is probably lying to you. So. But I also like the game for fun as well. Um, a couple of days ago, the big news in the gaming release world was the release of Diablo 3. And of course, I picked up a copy, but I promised myself that I wouldn't open it until this panel was concluded, because I might not be here. Um, but so, you know, I put it out of sight. I put it, I put it out of sight, and then as I, you know, went to work doing, you know, preparing for this discussion, it was just shocking to me to see this huge gap between something like Diablo 3 and the kind of games that we see used in classrooms today, 
which in many ways kind of resemble the animated flashcards or the, uh, the, shoot em, the, the shoot the right answer games that I played as a kid. And I think, you know, personally, it's absolutely ridiculous that, you know, it's 2012 and kids are still playing these games. And it's almost just as ridiculous that people are still making them. So I guess in my lifetime, you know, I really want to see uh, this gap between the commercial quality games and the and, and, um, educational games. I want to see this gap kind of close down. And joining, joining me today are, you know, a group of, uh, group of panelists from very different uh, perspectives who hopefully will give me that sense of optimism that I will see that in my lifetime. So um, I'm going to go down the line and you know, ask each of you to briefly introduce yourself, uh, what you do, and also a little bit about your gaming bias and, for the record, what your favorite game is. <laughs> Linda? So I should go on record as probably being the only one in this panel who is not a gamer. Um, I am a parent of gamers, though, like many of you probably in the audience. Um, I am the co-founder and uh, chief strategy officer of a nonprofit called Common Sense Media. And we are based here in San Francisco, but we are nationwide. And our whole purpose is to improve the lives of kids and families by giving them trustworthy information, education, and an independent voice to navigate a world of media and technology. Um, we, uh, we do that actually in three ways that I wanted to talk about. We rate, we educate, and we advocate. So the ratings is what we're probably best known from, for in this group. It's kind of age appropriateness ratings for media, everything from video games to apps to websites to movies to TV to books to music. Uh, what you may not know if you know Common Sense Media is that we've just beta launched uh, a new aspect of the ratings program, which is learning ratings. So now, in addition to age appropriateness, we're actually rating all digital media in terms of learning potential. And I've been working on this for about a year, and we're very excited about it. And you should all um, go out and uh, test it and tell us what you think uh, at commonsensemedia.org slash learning ratings. The educate piece of what uh, we do, and this is a piece of the organization that I built, is uh, a K through 12 digital literacy and citizenship curriculum that is now in over 30,000 schools in the country. And it's all about teaching kids how to go online and go mobile in safe, responsible, and respectful ways. And we are now moving from uh, doing teacher-guided curriculum to we have just launched something called a digital passport that is a onboarding set of mini games for kids in grades three through five to learn the basics of how to be a good digital citizen. Um, my bias about uh, common sense media, uh, my bias about games is that I am desperately awaiting kind of the whole market to rise in terms of games that have great learning potential. Um, we believe at common sense media that technology in general can teach kids how to collaborate, to empower them to connect, to learn, to do great things. And what we need in schools and in after school programs across the country are teachers who embrace that, parents who believe in it, um, and kids who can engage and have access to this kind of technology. You know, it also, I should also state that I think there are elements of navigating this world that kids need to learn so that ca they can be empowered to navigate it on their own. And that's where the digital literacy and citizenship comes in. But by and large, I am a big advocate for this. I think that discoverability is a big issue for parents and for teachers right now in terms of what are great learning games. And I'm hoping to learn from my panelists and to also be part of the conversation about how to make that more visible um, easily, uh, easy to discern, and uh, make sure that it's evaluated in a sound way. So as a um, person who never got off of kind of orientation island in Second Life in a virtual world because I couldn't, I kept flying into buildings, uh, I can tell you that I, I finished my first game all the way through at age 43, thanks to my 14-year-old son. Uh, and it was one that I love, and it's Journey. And um, I'll pass it on. Ben? Great. Um, 
So I am an ex-software developer. Um, I, I try not to use the word recovering, but, uh, but I did feel like I made an escape from that world into the world of secondary education. And um, I'm now finishing my seventh year as a high school teacher. Um, and I teach computer science. And I've been teaching computer science for the last five years. I got started in, in teaching math. And so a lot of my, um, a lot of my bias is going to come from sort of being an educator and being in the classroom. Um, but in teaching computer science, one thing that I found is that we don't have a broad agreement um, in academia about exactly where the boundaries of computer science are. Um, what, what's part of the subject and, and what's not. And so as a result, there isn't a real clear mandate around curriculum. Uh, there's no state testing. There's no state standards for, um, for computer science, which on the one hand is kind of a blessing, and on the other hand means that it's very hard to even get a job teaching computer science, even though it's something that people desperately want for their kids. It's not something that really fits into California's public education curriculum in a predefined box that leads to graduation. It's, it's actually an elective class. So from that perspective, um, I had a lot of freedom in developing my own curriculum. And the one thing that I've landed on as, as a really, really compelling activity for students that leads to a lot of learning and a lot of deeper insights is actually having them make video games. And the, the project that, uh, that I'm just concluding now, and my students will be presenting their, their final presentations about next week, um, involves my 11th grade class going to a, a neighborhood elementary school, and we take a field trip to, to visit this fifth grade class. We find out everything about what they're learning, what they're into, what kinds of movies they like, the media that they're watching. We interview their teacher, and then we go and try to make educational games to help them learn what they're learning in school. And, and so they already have educational games that they're forced to play. Um, and, I, and, I, and I mean forced <laughs> because um, they, they, they reported to, to my students not enjoying them, um, not wanting to play them, wow. wanting to do other things while they were in the library, because um, the library is the place where the computers are now. Um, and, and a lot of the games are, are like, what, like uh, the games that Tony described, where it's shoot the right answer and, and this kind of thing. Um, and so, so what I found is that my students were able to do better than that. Um, and, and not necessarily a lot better. It's for, for many of them, it's their first experience programming. It's their first time doing these things. But, um, but I really believe that the potential for games and education has to do with allowing students behind the scenes. That instead of us always saying, here's a product, here's something for you to consume, here's an activity that I want you to complete, instead to say, what are you interested in? What kinds of things do you want to do? And now let's figure out what you need in order to achieve that goal. And it's in that process of trying to seek the knowledge to figure out how to achieve that goal, which, which could be making a game that's as cool as that console game that they're mm -hmm. excited about, um, that, that's where, that that's where there's a huge amount of learning opportunities in this space. So um, I'm, I'm uh, you know, definitely have a very, very specific and particular view on, on games and education. Um, and I look forward also to, to hearing from the other panelists about uh, the things that they're working on. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of exciting stuff going on. Well, I'm Anthony Salcedo. I, I have the great privilege and fortune to support Microsoft's efforts in education around the world. So uh, that entails uh, traveling to many, many countries uh, every day uh, to celebrate the heroes in our societies, and that's our teachers. So Ben, thank you. And um, really think about how we can lift the, the way in which technologies make a difference in, in the classrooms. And frankly, we haven't reached anywhere close to the potential for technology to impact learning and learning outcomes. And very much like Tony said, in terms of the gap between what's possible and what's real today, uh, there's a long way to go. And a lot of that, and, and this might, will be my perspective on this conversation, a lot of that is actually putting technology and technology's potential behind the foundational elements of making change possible, thinking about the environment which includes language and aspiration. The most important thing we can do for students is to change their expectation of their own future when they enter classrooms. How do we think about process to sustain and scale and change in a transformational way? And then how do we think fundamentally about the people, the teachers, the students, uh, where learning happens? Too often in education, we start with technology. It becomes the pivot, the question, uh, the, the foundation for change, as opposed to a tool to accelerate and enhance the way in which we bring uh, change to students and teachers. So we've got to ex expand that pivot. 
And that certainly applies to the opportunities for games both in and out of the classroom, offline and online, etc. Uh, I am a gamer. I am an, a very active gamer. I'm one of the few people at Microsoft that puts their gamer tag on their business cards. <laughs> uh, it's ANTS, if you're curious, across PlayStation, Xbox, uh, and many other platforms. So I actively play games. I know the potential. Um, I am a gamer, and I, I see the magic it can have uh, for connecting with students uh, in powerful ways. And I think we have a huge potential to harness that magic uh, and help students uh, accelerate their progress both in the classrooms and in life. Um, <clears throat> my name is Lucian Vitell. Um, I, uh, I'm the CEO of Game Desk, and we're a um, research, uh, outreach, and um, development house. We build educational games. We do research on other people's games and find out how to integrate them in the classroom and how to help teachers work with games and interactive type environments in the classroom. And we serve uh, historically a lot of under, <coughs> underserved communities. And we look at um, what particular types of uh, learning outcomes can lead to re-engage the student in a particular type of experience. And so what we've done is we've built games and uh, game making type programs that create a sense of meaning around play and create a sense of meaning around some of the more difficult science and math concepts. Um, we're also launching a, a school. It's going to be called Playmaker. It's going to be in Los Angeles. And uh, we spent the last year and a half uh, doing that and we're, we're kind of going out on a limb on that school. We're going to get rid of grade levels. We're going to get rid of all subject area taxonomies. And uh, we're going to build a choose your own adventure school where all of the common core and state standards are going to be integrated. But um, it will be done in such a way uh, where um, a school will try to reflect more of what life is. And, and, and what I've been hearing from the, the panelists earlier is that there's a need for a, a school experience, um, you know, the question, you know, what is an education? Um, uh, an experience of learning to be more reflective of the type of world that we actually live in. So, you know, my grandfather uh, grew up in Vinton, Louisiana, and his largest portal for, for an education was, was the school. Uh, but that, that world has changed. Um, and in my generation, it was the television and early online experiences. But now we're in a completely multimodal, immersive, um, all f different types of discourse. Kids are tweeting, authoring their own experiences. They're creating their own games. They're, you know, practically everybody's phone is a, is a camera at some level. They can remix their own media. And now that those portals are, are extremely dynamic and they're at a global stage and the one place where that is not reflected <laughs> is in the school. That's right. So what are we doing? Uh, and so we need to completely rethink what education is. And I think gaming is a fine start. Because a game, uh, if, you know, if you talk to any good game designer, <clears throat> and we did this last week. We took a Carnegie Mellon stack. It's called the Art of Game Design. Have you guys mm -hmm. seen this? <laughs> and we took, we took that stack. And we replaced every instance of player with learner <laughs> and uh, game with school experience. And it was amazing how helpful those cards were for a teacher to think about. Even think about this. In the, in the one card it said, Cre uh, how do you know that your player is engaged and it is, is connected to the experience of play? How do you know your learner is engaged and connected to the experience of learning. This is Jesse Shell's. Yes, uh, so yeah. this is Jesse deck. Shell's yeah. deck. Mm -hmm. And so that was a real eye opener. So, you know, uh, you know my, my bias uh, uh, around games is that we're not thinking more creatively mm -hmm. about it. And in what ways can simulation interactivity uh, bring out types of learning that uh, were, you know, you were more difficult previously, and, uh, and I can go into some examples later on in our discussion. And my favorite game is a game called Out of This World. Um, a lot of 
folks may or may not know it, but it, it came out uh, for the Nintendo. And um, my secret pleasure, of course, though, is all the old SXX games, uh, because that's the ultimate stress reliever for me. My name's Noah Warder Fruin. I'm a professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where we have the first game major in the University of California system. Um, I know it seems kind of funny now, but trust me, uh, six years ago it seemed funnier. And, um, and I'm guessing six years from now it won't seem funny at all, right? Um, we're, not now, we're not the only one anymore. We have about um, 400 students in an undergraduate major that is basically computer science plus plus. Uh, and it's uh, more in demand than regular computer science, even though it's harder to get into and has more requirements. Um, and one thing I've seen is how motivated students are by making games. But probably the reason I'm on this stage is that we also have one of the largest technical research groups in the world focused on enabling new kinds of games. We have about 40 PhD and MFA students who are all trying to figure out what new kinds of games could be made with deep technology research. So we work on questions like, how can you customize a game for that individual player, um, generating all the assets and level design and other things that you would need for that particular person's play style? Or how do you do something like create a game that has really deep characters and story and actual strategy that you take in the fictional world rather than just strategy in the combat? Or how do you take this kind of next generation game with deep artificial intelligence and create authoring tools that enable someone like a teacher or a student to actually express their ideas in that context? Or how do you take play tra traces from millions of players and draw out the patterns you would need to understand what the different play styles are and how they should be addressed in the process of game design? Um, all that said, um, while I love computer games, and probably my favorite computer game is Knights of the Old Republic, um, I will probably never, ever be able to put as much time into a computer game as I've put into Dungeons and Dragons. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so Ben and Anthony, I don't, I, I don't think you guys mentioned. I, I, to, I didn't, I, I forgot to, to, to mention that. The last really game that I got game. really obsessed with is Triple Town. Triple Town. It's a, it's okay. a little iOS puzzle game. And Anthony? Um, I play lots of games. I, I like, I guess my favorite all time is uh, uh, Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. Right. I also like mm, Bioshock. Beautiful game. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Bioshock was good. So I'd like to kind of kick off our discussion with a question that's maybe not as technical because as Anthony, um, as, you, as you talked about in the, in the phone call, you know, like we, let's try to extract, you know, games, you know, separate games from the digital technology side and just think of games in itself. <laughs> And if you kind of strip out all of the technical, you know, graphics, auto interface stuff, um, a lot of things in life can be, you know, they, they can count as game. You know, life, they can say, is a game. And cynically, they say that love is also a game. <laughs> and education, of course, right, is also a game because you have rules, there are certain objectives, and then there are certain measures of progress. But if I were to come, you know, come at you, Anthony, with a pitch for, U.S. K-12 education now for Xbox Live. You know, what would be wrong? You know, like, what is wrong with education as a game in itself? Well, I think the, f the first thing you have to start is the motivation of the learner or the player in a game. And I think that's one of the things that students in classrooms today all over the United States don't really understand. What, what's the purpose for this? What's the relevant experience? What's the connection between what I'm learning and what I hope to do? What problems I hope to solve for the world, etc. Mm -hmm. Traditional games, whether it's playing chess or cards uh, or a video game, not only have rules, they have an objective, a goal, even if it's scoring the most points, etc. Students often see their education experience in classrooms too often throughout the United States as I'm going to pass a test so I can get to the next test or the next mm -hmm. semester or the next grade level, etc. We've got to provide a foundation for optimism for students to make an impact in their world, in their community, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So learning becomes relevant in terms of what I hope to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the big things I think. You know, if you think about the bones of gaming around incentivization, the language, the motivation, et cetera, we can apply that in classrooms without any computers, without any technology, mm -hmm. and do it effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is the science of assessment. The thing about a game that happens every day is students see at some point or learners or players see a game over screen. And 
I imagine many of you play games and you've gotten game over screens many times on your phone or your iPad or your game console and you didn't just throw the console in the air and say, I'm done and I'm o I, it's over. You've come back and you've tried harder and you've learned from your mistakes. Students get Fs on papers in all over the country and decide, I can't do math, I'm not good at science, or I'm going to drop out. And the assessment models we have in schools often are demotivators and the language of games, because it's connected to a greater challenge or mission, is an incentive for students to learn from their mistakes and play on. And those are the elements that we have to do. And I, I would say I'd start there and then create immersive, amazing experiences digitally if possible, but the foundation is actually what we have to embrace in schools all over the world. And Linda, how would you rate such a game since that is what uh, you do at Common Sense. I, I think the I think the element of um, of motivation is an important one, but I think that that gets trotted out. Mm -hmm. um, I think too frequently. What I think is exciting about games and and a rating a, a rubric against which I would rate is how do interests get driven or Good. lured al along curated through a game, uh, how, do, uh, how do kids persist? Um, how does resilience get built? I think that's part of what you were saying, Anthony. Um, these are all important, and I like the fact that on this panel, the constructivist part of thinking and learning is also increasingly part of the conversation. I don't actually like the term gamification. Um, it doesn't feel kid-centered to me at <laughs> all. Um, and if we're going to talk about learning and we're going to talk about games, talking about quests, talking about exploration, talking about kids' interests, talking about building things, that's the language that I would love to hear in this conversation. So I think Anthony's hit you know, so two of the really important things, but I think we could uh, flesh out what is, what is learning, what is gaming, and learning and education on this panel more fully. Those would be some of the mm -hmm. elements that I would add. Great, so you know, we've had about three, maybe four decades of you know, history about mainstream games and commercial games. You know, we've gone from the Pongs to, the, to Diablo 3s, from the Civilizations to the Farmville. You know, we've seen the move from like 2D to 3D, back to 2D, and now with you know, crazy motion sensors. And you know, throughout the, you know throughout the, these you know different periods and transitions, what have we really been what have we been able to learn about you know the the educational value of games, um, either from you know the player's perspective or from the designer's perspective? I mean, make no mistake, when you play a game, you're learning. You're you're consistently learning. What you're learning is the product of an entertainment model, most in most yeah. cases, um, but. What we, what we do know is that people are uh, consistently engaged. Uh, they will, they will com completely re they will go through an entire sequence over and over uh, in varying different contexts. I think what we need to learn, though, is we need to learn where, um, where is content, the learning of content, how can you actually pull all these levers that we've developed over, over the history of game design uh, to actually uh, create connections to things that we actually want kids to learn. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the field has to now focus on that type of mapping, mm -hmm. of really figuring out in what way can embodied learning with the connect, in what way can particular ways of scaffolding knowledge, learning different parts, you know, before you get to your guitar hero power, mm -hmm. you know, where, what do, where do you need to understand the disparate parts? How can you then resynthesize that knowledge, but do it in a way where you can learn math? How can you learn, how can you, <clears throat> how can you begin to learn fractions, relative distance, uh, proportions, mm -hmm. parabolas, and then resynthesize that knowledge to have a boss level experience where by only beating that level you have to prove your understanding of those of those parts and not only do you have to prove your understanding of those parts but you have to prove that you understand the relationship of those parts mm -hmm. and there's no reason why you can't do that with a game 
um, what we learned <clears throat> um, 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 when you explore knowledge from a game design perspective, for example, we're working on geoscience right now, plate tectonics, accretion of, of planetary objects in space. The minute you learn that Jupiter is actually a big minesweeper for the solar system that actually protects the Earth, you're able to immediately pull out a game design challenge. If you do not build Jupiter, you, Earth will not survive. And right. so there is a learning outcome for you. Mm -hmm. So this type of thinking is the type of thinking and the types of habits of minds that game designers need to grow from the previous lexicon of, of game design mm -hmm. into this sort of learning spectrum. I mean, I would say I think something we, we can also learn from is the, is the failures. Um, and and I, I mean specifically failures in, in educational games. Um, Keith Devlin is a, a mathematician. He's a professor at Stanford. He's written a whole bunch of books. And he also has a really interesting blog. And, and um, if you're interested in this topic, I would encourage you to read it. He has a series of posts about the challenges of making mathematical games. Mm. And one of the challenges that he describes is um, that j just as you said, every time you're playing a game, you are learning. This, that's, that's what Lucian said earlier. And, uh, and, and it's the thing that you're learning that we might have wrong. Um, and so he describes a, a, a particular student that they observed who, by playing this particular mathematical game, learned to get the correct answer in the context of the game, mm -hmm. but had an incorrect mathematical understanding of the underlying concept. Mm -hmm. And so even then when challenged in conversation about the mathematical concept, the student held very firm to his belief that, no, this is, this is how it works. And so every time he would get to a higher level, there would be some complication that would make his mental model fall apart, and he would just make some kind of adjustment in his mind and come up with a new set of rules to get the right answer, wow. which had no relationship to mathematics whatsoever. Um, <laughs> but he could get 80% really fast. And so he was just flying through this curriculum. Um, and, and so one of the big, one of the big challenges in, when we're designing learning experiences is to not only try to take the knowledge that we want them to learn and turn it into a game experience that's engaging and fun and more than just shooting the right answer, but also to avoid this particular trap, which is that just because someone is able to demonstrate proficiency in your system doesn't mean that they're demonstrating proficiency in the underlying subject that you were trying to teach. That's right. And I just add to that, you know, we built a measurement game where kids were extremely proficient at setting up the scale, being able to convert, they <laughs> learn the conversion equation, but they did not have the fundamental understanding that measurement is a human creation created by the human race to understand the nature of the universe. This fundamental idea, this, this engaging principle, which separates them from really understanding what measurement is. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's, a big, that's a big piece. And it's not even in the standards, by the way. Yeah. But I think that's part of the exciting way off-the-shelf games have been used. So things like SimCity and Civilization have been used in curricula to say, OK, we've played SimCity, and we've come to an understanding of how it models a city. And so we can you know, talk about what the ideas are in this. And then, OK, why are there no suburbs? Right? What, what would have to change about the mm. system if there were suburbs? You know, what's historically crazily inaccurate about civilization? Right? So part of what you want to do is have people learn something that's represented by a system, but you also want people to learn to be able to step back and critique that system. And I think in a society that's more and more shaped by computational processes, if people can't critique computational processes, they can't be good citizens. That's where the teacher comes in, right? Exactly. Linda, you were, you were mentioning it. that Exactly. Earlier. It was just... Yeah, yeah so, I, think, I think the concept of, you know, we tend to think about kids uh, learning with games being somewhat solo and perhaps collaborating with each other. But the role of the teacher, mm -hmm. and, in, and, and in which case is this uh, a game in which it's self-directed, self-paced learning, it might be adaptive in its nature, and w in which case is that discussion and reflection uh, and broadening of the conversation really important. And I think, you know, when I think about the school that you're um, building and creating, it, to me that's so critical to our knowing how to use, use this technology and have kids explore and, and, and define for us how, how the technology will be used. And I think that, that leap is a huge one. Now, not every student is going to be lucky enough to go to Lucian mm -hmm. School. <laughs> Most of our schools are not engaging, immersive, personal, et cetera. And the thing that we've got to try to do is lift 
the entire ecosystem in a school upward, giving teachers access to these conversations, using games as a tool to synthesize content. There is going to be some moving content to playful learning and immersive experiences, but it's very heavy and it will be done in pockets and specific examples. You can talk to Florida virtual schools and they say, well, we've been working for six years on conspiracy code and it's for a sliver of the curriculum for history in mm -hmm. sixth grade. So you've got a lot of experiences that will be fragmented at best currently. Mm -hmm. You've got to bring the concepts that we know around playful learning, purposeful learning, et cetera, to the classroom, to the lecture, to the environment in the school, in and out of the experience of an immersive game or interactivity. So that discussion, that questioning can happen in a classroom as gameplay is happening outside of the classroom perhaps. Mm -hmm. But that, that immersion has to happen. That's right. It's creating a visible window to this model of practice. Mm -hmm. And that kind of leads into this question that I've been wanting to get at, um, because a lot of the educational games that we know of today or that we use today tend to focus on, they're very math focused, very science focused. And if you, or you know, even when they do cover other topics, you know, it's usually done so in a multiple choice kind of, it, multiple choice kind of form. And in a way that kind of makes sense if you think about how programs are built, right? Because they're built upon a, a math core, a math logic, and they have a complex array of you know, if-then statements and conditionals. But how does this work if we want to like, cover subjects that don't fit neatly into these preset algorithms, such as writing or creativity or critical thinking skills? Well, this is, a, this is the immersion of technology in terms of learning content, et cetera. We can do the transition and automation fairly well. Mm -hmm. uh, comedy, emotion, romance right. in, in content and in video games is harder to come by. Mm -hmm. And we're just starting to get to a continuum where programmers understand how to bring uh, experience, mood into games. Mm -hmm. And that hasn't even scratched the surface in the content that we have in traditional textbooks or learning experiences, et cetera. So that's part of the journey that we've got to push. Yeah, mm -hmm. one investor told me that whoever is able to build a game that can address this is going to be the next millionaire. Makes you, makes you cry? Makes me <laughs> cry a little bit. Well, we just released a, a funny game called Prom Week. It doesn't try to make you cry, right? But it's, I think, one of the first games where the gameplay is really about social relationships, about mm. saying, you know, like, uh, you know, Zach is saying something nasty to Monica about Simon, and that's changing the landscape just the way you would change the landscape with, you know, buffs and debuffs and other things in an MMO, right? Um, and we are trying to use that in different sorts of learning projects with partners like the Defense Department and the European Union to get at things like bullying or being a good stranger. But I think you know, games are only starting to reach the technological level where we can actually take on things that aren't straightforwardly computational like okay. mathematics. And so I think it's sort of one of our exciting new territories. But um, yeah, it'll be a while before we really do that. So our, our second year, um, at when we were working with these uh, schools, um, the teacher said, well, you know, one of my biggest problems is just getting the kids to leave their problems at home. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I have to be their, their shrink and their, I have to be a whole lot of things more than, and than just being their teacher. And we talked to them about, you know, what are kind of things that they notice about the kids. And they said, well, they don't have an awareness to their bodies. They don't know when they're angry. They don't know. They're not connected. And so that put us in a position. We, we decided to do this game for National Institute of Health that basically uh, reads your pulse and skin conductance. And we try to build a game that helps kids know when they're getting stressed or when they're not getting stressed. Mm -hmm. And they go into an underground dojo, hip hop dojo, where they learn from these different masters. One teaches them breathing, one teaches them positive self talk, one teaches them muscle tension. And then they go to these dojos. And the fear dojo, the anger dojo, the frustration dojo. For example, the fear dojo, classic nightmare situation. You're trapped in these catacombs. You can't kill anything. You can't do anything. This, this evil spirit chases you while you're trying to collect all of his bones and put it in sacred ground. Mm -hmm. And the only thing you do is run and hide. And if you panic, classic nightmare, right? right. Things start slowing down. <laughs> it's like you're running in molasses. But all of that was really completely our, <laughs> our uncomfort zone. Yeah. And it was just working with kids and teachers. I mean, even in an area that was our uncomfort zone. Like, we didn't even know whether we were going too far 
or, or what, you know? And we didn't even know how well the device was going to work. We went through a gazillion different uh, biofeedback devices. But you know, you just, I think game designers have to respond to something. Like, you know, just respond. If a teacher has, that's why I think you have to be working with the teachers. Game designers have to be working with teachers. Uh, the type, you know, you know, we were talking and he was talking about how the community is this big component. Working with the community. Um, definitely, you're not going to be able to build anything to anything if you're not working with where, you know, where it's at. And that's what we found. I'm really, I'm really glad you said that because a, a lot of times, I, I get a lot of emails from people from, from well, okay, let's say tech startups who say, <laughs> will you try this thing? Like, try this thing. We're looking for people, teachers, to try things in a classroom. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, where did it come from? Mm -hmm. If you made a, a whole game to teach algebra, did you go and look at how algebra is taught? Not because that's the best way, but because otherwise you're doing it in a vacuum. I mean, you wouldn't go and try to make a word processor without looking at how people write things. You wouldn't go and, you know, you wouldn't go and try to, uh, you know, try to make a, a CAD program without looking at how architects work. So why would you go and try to make an algebra learning program assuming that your memories of seventh grade are enough to kind of carry you through that <laughs> development process? It's, it's, it's kind of silly. So I'm really, I'm really glad yeah. you said that. I mean, it's like we have to be present with each other in doing, uh, you know, doing the research to really figure out what is needed and what's working and what's not working. And, and I would argue that that comes out of, and you know, and I'm a guy who left USC, cushy job, a faculty job, and, and really, you know, if you look at the way a lot of grant funding works, it works to do kind of what you're saying. Now, I'm not speaking to all grants, mm -hmm. but min much of the grant work supports me to come into your school, come, develop it in my own lab, come into your school, drop it in, see how it goes, do my research, write my paper and get tenure. And that's, that's pretty much... Or not get tenure. Or not get tenure, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but, but, you know, I think, and, and I'm seeing, you know, there are some big changes now in the NSF. There's some big changes now that are looking for more long-term change, designing grants to have more relationships with schools, which I think is a wonderful new trend. But I would say I'm not surprised that, you know, you get these calls, uh, but I think that does have to change. I want to bring up a more of a sobering reality. I know we're having a really good time here, but you know when we talk about working with teachers, you know, getting teachers involved in these games, there was a recent survey from the uh, the Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop that surveyed over 500 teachers about their attitudes and use of games. And one of the questions they asked was, "What are the obstacles to you using games in the classroom?" So, in order of prominence, number one was cost, two is access. And three was um, an emphasis on standardized tests. Now, one and two, I'm not as worried about cost and access. That those, these two things, I'm pretty sure technology usually, you know, will s solve in some form in the future. But it's this emphasis on standardized testing that I think can be a huge crux on, you know, your dreams as game developers and what students actually want to play. So I guess the question is, how can we resolve resolve this tension that teachers face? when they're being mandated with teaching basic skills so students can pass tests. But at the same time, these students want to engage their students in more you know, long form games that involve higher level orders of thinking. Well, I can tell you that the, the fundamental assumption is actually not proven by research. Mm -hmm. um, what teachers are saying, if I teach to the test, if I have boring lectures that students aren't engaged with, that aren't personal, that don't inspire my kids, as long as I'm preparing them for the questions that they're likely to get on the test, I'll have better outcomes. Mm -hmm. And research doesn't show that. Uh, we work, we're, Microsoft is working on a project with Intel and Cisco called the Assessment for Teaching 21st Century Skills. And there's 200 university researchers around the world working on projects in many countries. Mm -hmm. One of the countries is Singapore, which mm -hmm. across math and science have very high levels of scores on the piece of benchmark, one or two in many categories. And Dr. Horn Moon, who's been part of the project, started working with soft skills mm -hmm. in partly to the reaction that Singapore has around sort of test preparation mm -hmm. and very rigid learning styles. In the pilots that they did, the students who were doing soft skills or leadership, creative thinking, et cetera, as part of their curriculum, not preparing for the standardized tests like other schools, those schools did far better than other kids. 
And it's very, not, it's very natural. Right. When kids are more engaged, they're more inspired, when learning is more personal. And one of the things that every teacher in America looks for is personalization and learning. But most classrooms start with open up your book to a specific page mm -hmm. or we're going to work on a specific example. So learning is not personal because it's driven by content. Mm -hmm. So by bringing these immersive experiences, by making students enjoy learning mm -hmm. in a playful way and connecting it to the things that you're going to be assessed on, you can actually achieve better outcomes. So we first got to give teachers hope that they can get kids inspired in the classroom right. and produce better results on the tests. It would be interesting to see if, um, if those results from Singapore translate to the U.S. In, in, a, in a really highly structured society where, where there's a lot of discipline and, and kind of rigid uh, social exactly. expectations. Yeah. The U.S. is part of the project and it absolutely translates. It, it does, really. Oh, that's great. That's, that's kind of encouraging to hear because there is a, lot, there is a, a huge emphasis on sort of standardized preparation for standardized tests. And I, and I think that maybe this is another variety of this same problem. As soon as you put out a metric, somebody tries to optimize for it. They try to take a shortcut to it. And by taking that shortcut, we're missing some of the important things. So oh, maybe, maybe the same as Bobby, you know, with his uh, mistaken understandings of mathematics, we're also trying to take that shortcut to bumping up our numbers for our kids' test scores. And I mean, I see this, I see this in schools commonly. We look for the students who are close to the boundary of reaching the next level of achievement uh, according to some you know, quantitative thing. And we'll focus on those particular students and work extra hard on preparing them because there's more of a payoff if they make it just a few points higher in, in the test score than if some other kid makes a few points higher. And, and this is completely insane. It doesn't make any sense, but schools everywhere are doing it. And there's, and there's quick correlation to one basic thing. Kids will show up if they're mm -hmm. excited about learning in the learning process. If you are doing a game or a project, et cetera, that students are motivated to, they will show up to the classroom as opposed to either drop the course or stay at home, et cetera. So you're one half the battle. So if I'm focusing on the test and kids aren't engaged, they drop out, they leave, they don't show up to class, I'm missing a, a prior. We're often optimizing for the ideal scenario. The reality is there are lots of kids who just don't show up. It seems yeah. to me, uh, you know, sure. we've got I think this problem will go away over time. Okay. Um, and I think there are three things that are our friends in that. One is data. I mean, if, 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 if games can look and we can create assessments that are meaningful, that are aligned to common core standards, which are actually quite flexible, there's room to redefine what exists, and the data over time um, is compelling, then these blended learning models that combine both kind of traditional teacher-guided classroom work with personalized learning through games and other technologies, the data will help make the argument both to teachers, to parents, to school systems in general. And so I think what's key is that the uh, folks that are developing these new learning tools are thinking about the Common Core standards that are are looking at design in a very uh, cogent way mm -hmm. and are looking at their data and sharing that data so that we all learn from it. But I, I, I really am optimistic that in the mm -hmm. course of the next few years, you know, uh, companies like Dreambox are, are helping to change that mm -hmm. language and others will right. as well, nonprofits will as well. So. So when you, so I guess what you kind of implied there was that you think the market is going to shift to a to, to a, a point where, you know, that will allow for adoption of these innovative, te innovative technologies. Is that what you're... I don't think it's going to happen overnight, but I think the mm -hmm. way to do it and what I think is emerging that I'm really excited about are models of schools that are in integrating technology and taking a kind of a whole community and very organic, comprehensive approach to looking at all the things that need to be in place mm -hmm. for this to work. Not just putting the technology in, looking at the teacher training, looking at the classroom design, looking at the schedule in the day, looking at where, where things are housed and practices. So um, uh, Game Desk is one. There's an organization called New Classrooms that's mm -hmm. working mm -hmm. in terms of um, blended learning, education elements. These organizations are taking a much more holistic approach, and that those stories, if they're successful and get um, amplified in the press, will change the dialogue. So, to our game designers, um, 
what are your perspectives on you know where the market's going with regards to you know the kind of innovative R and D that you guys are putting towards? Um, any any encouraging signs that? Encouraging signs on the education market. On the on the market <laughs> for your games. Not in California. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there's encourage investment signs. Uh, Such you know, as. Uh, so there there's a, you know, a lot more. Um, investment in educational entities going on right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know when we first started, that was hard to come by, hard to find. I mean, I would say that when, when we first started the whole game learning enterprise, even as a research mm -hmm. component, you know, um, the grants weren't there. The philanthropy wasn't there. Mm -hmm. That's not the case anymore. And up until very recently, the, the venture capitalism wasn't there as much, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and largely, um, people are becoming more educated. And as social entrepreneurial uh, venture capitalists are getting more and more involved, these are, these are people who really want to get their heads around why it's not working, not just why you know, the market trend or the market history. And those are the types of discussions we're having constantly. I mean, the announcement that came out today on us would have never have happened, I don't think, even a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a huge shift. I don't think AT&T would have ever have even considered making an investment like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, people are willing to sit down. You walk through where things can be, and um, people are open to seeing where it can go. Great. Yeah, and I'd say um, I think one of the issues with assessment is that you know most assessment happens in a way that's totally divorced from the context where learning happens. And one of the things that's exciting about games and exciting about the data that we can gather from games mm -hmm. is that we can have people be assessed in the game context mm -hmm. for what they've learned, which is also the context where they have done a bunch of learning. And we may see fewer effects of people, um, you know, like I was one of those kids in school who did unnaturally well on standardized tests. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I was in a good position to talk about you know, how bogus that was, right? Mm. And how I knew there were people who knew the material better than me who were doing worse because of the standardized test right. framework, right? And so I think, you know, that's one of the exciting things about games. Mm -hmm. And then obviously I think one of the other exciting things about games is that um, we can, uh, let's say, root around some traditional mm -hmm. educational context as well, you know? Right. Um, so I know a lot of um, parents are you know um, concerned about screen time and things like that, and I, I understand that concern. But I also see you know how much my three-year-old picks up from a variety of experiences, ranging from Dance Central to things that are meant to be mm -hmm. educational software for the iPod or something like that. And I just think that future is really bright, even if it um, yeah just totally avoids the questions of mm -hmm. teaching to the test or even there being a test. That's right. Absolutely. Great. <laughs> and we're going to have Q&A shortly after, but I want to you know, wrap, th wrap things up with one question that actually really bugs me on a personal level. And it's this word gamification. <laughs> and you know, recently, in the past couple of years, there's been this, this gospel of gamification going around lately. And it's not that I have a problem with its core concepts of motivation and reward and engagement. It's that I think it's given a lot of people the wrong cue to continue making these flashcard games that we all hate. And so to me today, when I hear that something is gamified, it means just as much to me as when they put that organic sticker on the fruit or when they you know, put that 100% natural sticker on the fruit. I don't know what it, what it really means to me. So I guess you know, to wrap things up, you know, what are your opinions on the pitfalls or the misconceptions that you would like others to avoid making? when we're either talking about games or making games? Well, uh, should we just go down the row? Or? Sure. <laughs> uh, so. Personally, I think you know, the heart of games is play. But I think a lot of people who talk about gamifications think the heart of games is points and levels and badges. And um, I think that you know, points and levels and badges are things that play activities has, have brought on because they're powerful just the way like my coffee shop and my airline and things have brought them on and they have just as much relationship to the core thing right mm -hmm. there's there you know like points are connected to coffee in about zero ways mm -hmm. except that you know you might get people to come back to the same coffee shop 
And games are connected to points in about zero ways, mm -hmm. except for that it's a way of structuring a core play experience. So I'm interested in gamification, but I'm interested yeah. in gamification if we actually rethink the core activity, right? If we think mm -hmm. maybe about playification, how do we take this activity and make it playful, bring the thing that matters about games to it instead of the decoration around games? I love that, playification. <laughs> I'm going to use it. Um, so um, I, I, I think that um, rewards without context or meaning are not really rewards. And I think that at any stage in any of, uh, you know, throughout all of our lives, we know when we're duped. So you know the old, uh, I, you know they did that thing with Freakonomics where they just gave the kids money. Mm -hmm. But you know eventually that there's, some, there's a lack, you know, I, I bet on humanity. That is, you know, we know when there's something along the way and we're playing a game that it's ultimately not going to fulfill us. Now for some people it takes them a while to figure that, that out. Other people, they, they, they figure, you know, what's going on here? There's not, there's not meaning here. Mm -hmm. And I would say that, you know, even in our own game design, we'll fall prey to it. So we were designing a game on aerodynamics, and the, a lot of the game designers were like, well, yeah, so let's have them do a spin, and we'll get, have them right. go through three rings, and then they'll get this star. And then I said, but then I said, well, wait a minute. What did they just learn? They learn if they, spin, right. they, if they just did a spin. Mm -hmm. So what if we highlight that in order to equalize their lift and their, their gravity, which is when lift and gravity is equalized, you fly straight. When you create a certain amount of, when you double your lift on one wing and you mm -hmm. reduce, you, then you spin. Right. So if the reward is connected to performing the actual learning, then that reward becomes meaningful. And then in the future, that's connected to something. So I, I really think that we want to get away mm -hmm. from any kind of, 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 I mean, we've learned this through history, mm -hmm. that all of these types of surface feature rewards will not serve in the end. And I would say test taking is, is in that same category. Traditional test taking. <laughs> yeah, I, and I have um, somewhat similar view, but also a different viewpoint, because I think as it relates to core game design, mm -hmm. If you're thinking about gamification, it's, it's not where it needs to be. We have to be thinking differently about how we can em embrace it. But the reality is, just like games have been around for hundreds of years, uh, gamification, or whatever word you want to use, and I could argue it's a good word or not, it exists beyond video games or electronic media. So Gary Kasparov is working as chess as a metaphor for leadership and decision making. Mm -hmm. That's a game. There's never a computer or any on switch that comes in chess. There are instinctive motivations on the language of games. So I can turn a project into a mission. Right. And Arizona State University is actually granting mission-based degrees. Mm -hmm. You don't get a Bachelor of Science in, uh, in uh, a degree in, in Arizona State. You get a degree in saving energy. And that is connected to the motivation, the achievement, the the goal, and I think that's a thread line that we need to link to games. But I would say that what you've just described, your exemplars, are totally contextualized and totally connected. Absolutely, to me. absolutely. Yeah. And there's other areas where we can use the the language, the the teamwork, the the group, to um, to drive activity. And one of the activities that we're working on in with Rochester Institute of Technology, Just Press Play, they use real world achievements or badges. Uh, one of the the a, a very specific example. There's a course that is notorious for students dropping mid-semester. And they have assigned a, an achievement to the class called Undying. If everyone makes it through the course without dropping, the students get a badge, which is meaningless. It doesn't have any great association, etc. But what happens is the students, motivated by that achievement, will grab, grab you out of your dorm uh, to yeah. get to the class. Mm. And if you're having trouble, share notes. It fosters collaboration because the group is motivated towards a goal or a mission or achievement. And I think that's an important element for learners to do and for teachers in classrooms all over the world who don't have the luxury of computers or modern technology to think about how can I motivate learners in ways that we know science is doing. University yeah. of Washington is focusing on the incentivization of the learning process. And the traditional learner, which learns from a single source, I'm going to tell you what I know about a subject and you're going to enhance. One of the things we know about gameplay is it fosters different approaches. 
You may be a sniper, I may be a shotgun user, you may be a melee expert in a game. We could have completely different experiences and learn different things about the game world and the gameplay. Applying that to subject or content could be vastly different than what the current environment of learning is, which is very limited to a one perspective, one textbook, one teacher. So those are elements I think we need to pull in. Now, as it relates to game design, I think we have a lot of, a lot of work to do, but I think we can bring learning forward, by, forward faster if we embrace gamification or whatever we're going to use much more holistically than just thinking about traditional electronic media. I'm glad you brought up the, um, the example of the class and kind of like encouraging each other because uh, the, the note that I want to sound is, is similar to, to I think what everyone has said here, which is gamification taken at a shallow level and just sort of putting a points counter on top of something. Um, it, it's sort of pretending that it can offer an extrinsic motivation, but it's a pretty thin extrinsic motivation. And one thing that we know is that intrinsic motivation is a lot more powerful mm -hmm. than extrinsic. And so your, your story about, the, um, about the, the class kind of helping each other out is something that sounds is really encouraging to me because if you look at the social gamification that has happened, uh, we're looking at essentially Farmville, which is kind of the, the, the least, uh, the, the most soulless kind of empty <laughs> social interaction that you can have. It's forcing people to interact with their friends socially in order to achieve things within a game that's structured to get them to be forced to pay money. <laughs> and, and that's the whole point of the social interactions. It's all around that. So I think we have to you know, maybe first start out by, not try, by trying to not be evil uh, with, with, <laughs> with, with, our, with our learning games, but, but maybe go a little bit further than that and be cautious in how we structure the social interactions. Because for every time that somebody is winning or beating someone else, there's also somebody who's on the other end of, of that equation. And sometimes that's okay. When you're playing a video game with your friend and, and you win, and then, and then I frag you, and then, then we're having fun because it's a collaborative process that we're spending that time together because we enjoy what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But if the teacher puts a gold star by your name and not by someone else's name, eventually those gold stars start to add up to not a badge that that person is proud of, but a marker for the other kid that they can't ever get there. Mm -hmm. They can't do that. And so I think we have to be very careful in how we give praise, how we give rewards, and make sure that we're paying attention to the psychology uh, of how that's all going to affect the learners as they progress. Um, not just because they might stop playing the game or because they might get, you know, get fed up with it, but because they might actually come to an incorrect conclusion about themselves and their own potential as learners. Fantastic. Um, for me, I, as, I, as I, I always think about language in terms of a public dialogue and, and engagement, and my concern about the word gamification is that I think it undersells the learning potential that is in gameplay. I mean, all of the things that, that lead to good learning, whether it is kind of interest-driven exploration whether it is the potential for collaboration in a game that may be stronger than a, in a lot of other learning settings, mm. whether it is, um, it is the constructive piece that I spoke of before, the quest to go on. So I, I, I think of uh, questing in games as the epitome of you know, lifelong learning which we all want our kids um, to embrace. And so I worry about it because you go so quickly to um, rewards and rewards equals engagement. And I think kids are engaged in games for a lot more reasons than the rewards. So uh, language is important in a public dialogue and uh, I think we need to come up with a more robust language of why this is really great learning. So. Yeah, language is excellent. Piece. Yeah. All right, great. Well, thank you. we have any questions out in the audience. Um, right there. Hi, my name is Oliver Starr. I'm with a company called Pearl Trees. One of the things that strikes me in listening to you guys talk is how virtual everything you're talking about is. And it, it seems at some point that engaging people in the real world as part of gaming would make it uh, both a much better educational experience and a much more fulfilling one. I mean, uh, you know, I think back on when I was a Boy Scout and I earned merit badges for actually learning specific skills, which to this day, as somebody who spends a tremendous amount of time outdoors, are invaluable. 
And I, I just don't hear you guys talking about anything that connects the real world. It's all behind a screen and a joystick. Can you comment on that a little well, bit? I can, I, I've been the person on this, this panel saying that. I, I completely agree with you. Um, one of the things, uh, the, a project that we did with Smithsonian was something called Interrobang. And it was a very simple concept to bring uh, game-based uh, elements into a classroom without any structure of a game. Kids would get badges or achievements for uh, learning about a specific um, part of their neighborhood, or building a fort, or uh, doing a, a, a good deed in their community. And the gamification, or the elements, were the competitive elements of classrooms or groups of teams forming up to do these things that have to do with social pride, or science, or understanding about specific things as it relates to safety, or maybe talking to someone who served in a war and writing and blogging about that work. Uh, to get kids motivated by an action to do something. And, and it was amazingly successful. And the things that we found from teachers were it motivated different types of kids to do things that largely were motivated by the ability of competition to drive behavior and students having a, a foundation for understanding their world, their relevant connection to their community in a deeper way. So I completely agree with you to get people outside of their environment. <clears throat> One of the the Just Press Play achievements in Rochester Institute of Technologies, and Tony and I were talking about this before, is students have to meet with or talk to every faculty member on the campus. And they get an achievement by collecting business cards from every one of the faculty members, and they show that they've done that and put them in there. Now that was a way to get students to have a broader connection to people, to meet people, to get the faculty to meet the students in a way that there wasn't before possible. And that's a way that we can synthesize gameplay elements or motivational elements with the real world, and I think that can be hugely, hugely powerful. Uh, and certainly kids are motivated by the desire to make a difference in the world. A lot of the best games that we see students creating are connecting to solving real problems that are facing kids, whether it's uh, from gender, bi gender bias or social issues, water pre preservation, et cetera. That connection to the real world is natural in game design, and we can do a better job of bringing it outside of the technology or virtual world as well. I'd like to say, in my defense, <laughs> um, I got asked digital questions, I gave digital answers. <laughs> but uh, I can tell you that that is not the philosophy uh, of the school that we're building, for example. We have a high tech, low tech, no tech rule for all playful and interactive experiences in the school. So we view technology as a tool. It's agnostic. This is technology, a pencil's technology, blackboard's technology, and all those tools are good for certain types of experiences. And for example, the digital experiences that we actually build, you'll notice we build a game on aerodynamics. It is not easy to go into your backyard and fly. <laughs> <laughs> it is not easy to build and accrete planetary bodies in the cosmos. <laughs> it is not easy to condense time and experience geoscience from a billion years into a two-hour experience. Right. In this way, digital experiences should take people to places that they could not go, to br enhance concepts that are hard to understand uh, or, or ways in which simulation can bring together f to, to bear. Uh, but, you know, I can tell you that, like, you know, in our thermal thing, like, do you feel some heat? That is a simple right. exercise. You can get, if I got everybody to get into this row right now, and I got you guys to, to you couldn't go past the end of that mark. We were going to play a quick physical game, and I was going to have you all start jumping around and kind of dancing around. What you would see is the crowd would come out to the front here because they would, they would have no room to move. And basically that you guys all would have simulated what molecules do inside of a thermometer. I think we actually probably all agree, right? I mean, right. So, so in yeah. that way, it's, it's all about what works. I think and, you're getting you're technology idea. stuff because the panel was called technology and education. <laughs> but I, I mean, I really do think that designing a good game is kind of just a subset of designing a good learning experience. And that's, that's what right. Lucian's talking about. But I think, and there are also a lot of games increasingly where the missions and quests take kids offline. They right. take them, uh, that, that, that's the extension, that is the challenge. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this 
plays out over time as kids create more content, as they create their own quests. Um, there's another school um, called Quest to Learn in New York City, and there's a new one being built in Chicago, where, too, the whole center of philosophy, this is a woman named Katie Salen, who's been part of the MacArthur Digital Media and Learning Network, um, where the whole concept is game design is good learning. And so there are games and video games, but there is a game within the classroom, as, as we've been talking about. But the whole city becomes a game board as well. And there are missions and quests that take kids all over New York City. And so uh, what's great about game design is people think about design and they think about that online and they think about it offline mm -hmm. and um, there's a creativity that's brought to bear in a field trip that didn't exist before in you know the the role plays <coughs> that I've seen in that school are unbelievable so I think the the thought leaders in the field of gaming and learning are actually trying to make that traverse that line which kids frankly don't even see. They don't think about their digital lives and their right. offline lives. Right. It's Great all point. life. Right. And so uh, the good designers are actually uh, you know, creating those experiences that are seamless. And that's one of the things we're pursuing with artificial intelligence is that you know, in alternate reality games, which are the games that get people out in the world the most, as the ratio of players to puppet master you know, effort uh, changes, um, you get less and less customized experiences and more and more the players are hearing about a cool thing that happened to someone else. Right. And one of the things we're interested in doing is connecting the players to each other to create those cool experiences by reasoning about the behavior of different people in the player group so that we can actually make a deeper connection to the real world. But yeah, I'd say even in a computer science department where there's always got to be a cool algorithm, there's nobody who's not thinking about this connection. Let's take the next question. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Saperstein, and I'm in the university environment, not the K through 12 environment. So my question goes really to uh, upper grades. It, and, and I guess this is to Anthony Salcedo first and anybody else. From a national policy standpoint, there seems to be a greater, greater disconnect between skill sets and the world of work in terms of getting people prepared for the world of work, which is where the university environment is. Mm -hmm. Plus the fact that you have a lot of people who are now out of work, need to be retrained, and are not finding work, and it's a national disaster as Absolutely. well as a California disaster. So you folks have been talking about K through 12, talking about subject matter, and I guess the question is, when you're looking at training people to actually go into a structured work environment which is not gamified or playified or whatever-fied <laughs> you're talking about, you are you looking at how do you train people either to be badged for particular competencies that will then be able to be translated either through community colleges or courses as MIT and Stanford are doing online to badge millions in subject areas and I'm assuming that there's some technology involved in gamification but are you folks from a policy standpoint, because Anthony, I presume you're involved in those discussions, is that happening and is that where the major opportunity is? Because yeah, I'm concerned about people who go to school, have experiences that you've all described, and then they go to work at Clorox and they find that that environment that you've created just doesn't exist and they are ill-prepared for what they're going to have to do in whatever job function they're going to get into. Well, thank you for the question. First off, I would say thank you for connecting uh, the mission of higher education institutions with preparing students for the workforce. I don't know if that's shared by many institutions or all institutions <laughs> universally. Uh, but it's important. Uh, youth unemployment in this country is a problem in places like Spain and Greece. It's upwards of 40, 50 percent. It's an epidemic where we're preparing kids uh, in many ways not for the workforce that exists. The initiative that I talked about, the assessment for teaching 21st century skills is all about how we can bring competency focus to the university and the classroom and certainly that's a critical er area. We hire for competencies, not for content. So collaboration, creative thinking, decision making, leadership, etc. is what we uh, define. Increasingly, because gameplay is all about skills and experiences and collaboration and teamwork, etc., a lot of the elements that can be designed into a great game, whether it's online or offline, virtual or, or physical, 
can be enhanced through that play. The traditional learning paradigm of content and assessment is what we're, what, what's broken in the environment that, of work today. So I think gameplay is closer than most classrooms already, and moving 21st century skills is there. From a policy standpoint, the work of, of this project that we've done is to influence PISA, and OECD was part of it, the people who do the PISA tests, to include a 21st century competency benchmark rating for all countries' education system in 2015. So the US, like other countries, will be rated not only on science, math, reading, et cetera, but 21st century competencies uh, as defined by uh, this curriculum and what will be rolled out by OECD. So it's important work from a policy perspective to get that, that student geared up from primary and secondary all the way through higher ed. Next. Oh. I'm Ted Kahn. Um, I with a company called Design Worlds for Learning and also affiliated with the Tech Museum and uh, CalArts. Um, I want to go back to something I started my whole career with, which is about 35 years ago, and it was to try to use this technology to improve creative thinking and imagination. An awful lot of the games that we have are zero-sum in one sense or another. I think a lot of the rewards in society are zero-sum, or at least that's the way they're perceived. And yet, if you're going to try to actually promote creativity uh, and creative thinking, I think you need to move to a totally different kind of an environment. I just testified about this up in Sacramento because people have gutted the arts curriculum in California. And what they fail to realize is by doing that, they're gutting a huge kind of opportunity to improve the creativity of kids. So I don't know how many of you have seen Kane's Arcade um, on the internet. Um, it, it, there's an example of something. You want to talk about low-tech and unbelievable high-tech promotion of something that's one kid in East Los Angeles um, yeah. who now has yeah. over $200,000 in scholarship and had nothing less than four weeks ago. So that's one pointer. The other one is, is massive kinds of things like citizen science and citizen creativity. There's a game called Fold It up at you know, in, in University of Washington, which people have actually discovered new viruses or proteins um, that nobody's ever seen before because hundreds of thousands of people who are puzzle lovers and puzzle folders and makers are all involved in something like this. So I'd kind of like a, a, kind of a, a sense from you all about how do you start to encourage more kind of creative discovery kinds of things when most of the system in terms of the rewards that are given are still around, you know, I win, you lose. Yeah. Um, well, who's going to the Makers Fair this weekend? Anyone? All right. So, I mean, you want to see some kids doing some pretty remarkable stuff. I encourage you to go to the Education Pavilion or some of the other booths. You're going to see some pretty remarkable stuff. Um, I mean, from our perspective, uh, we started out with kids making. I mean, we, Game Desk even started out with we went to underprivileged kids and we just had them build games. And the goal was to see if they could get re-engaged in computational literacy. That led to becoming re-engaged in Common Core Math, and then it led to becoming engaged in thinking like engineers. That is, resynthesizing your knowledge in a way that engineers have to do. And uh, I'd say a majority of, of a lot of the curriculum that we've done for the school, because obviously we can't build a bunch of games or even integrate a bunch of games out there because they're not, they're not out there to fill 6th, 7th, 8th grade curriculum, is that um, you know, making is amazing. Uh, making is where it's at. America needs to be making again. Um, kids want to make. They want to be entrepreneurs. I don't know if you're familiar with the Minnesota Charter School. Anybody familiar with that school? Unbelievable. They gutted out their entire school, turned it into a Google startup environment where all the kids are building their own projects facilitated by teachers. It's pure creativity, project exploration, um, and you know, the, some of the stuff out of there is remarkable. Again, High Tech High in San Diego, is, if anybody's familiar with that, you're looking at kids who are articulating at a level that is for, some third, fourth year uh, uh, science and engineering degree level of articulation. You got kids talking about engineering and making at a pretty sophisticated level, articulating. And articulation is very important because it shows the ability to reason it shows the ability to be able to think about what it is you understand and communicate it to others at a high level. And that is all about creativity. The other thing I'd say is more sandbox games, more <laughs> stuff about 
kids building yeah. these these yeah. inventions, making these worlds. So you know, big promoting uh, developers out there building the sandbox. Minecraft. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, Minecraft. Minecraft. The there you go. Love yeah. that. Did you see the zoom of the you know, the thing online? It shows the zoom of the universe. It goes from like the smallest yep. Yep. thing to the, and then it shows somewhere. Minecraft. I don't even know what yeah. it is. It's like it shows like a the cosmos, and then like the size of Minecraft yeah. universe. It's like equivalent yeah. to. Unbelievable! So the amount of and, and that's and all creation. That's interesting amazing. story about about that. Um, that 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 little zoom animation was actually made by some twins who are freshmen in high school. That Is I actually that right? I worked right. with them over the summer at, at Google's Cape program, the computer um, computation and programming experience. That was a summer program for eighth graders entering high school just to get them excited about about computer science and engineering. And so there was no you know there was no test, there was no curriculum. The mandate was get them excited. And so we made robots out of Legos, and we you know made apps on phones, and and right. I had kids made a pinball machine and out of cardboard, and yeah, it was I mean <laughs> it, cardboard and Legos and, and a laptop. It was. It's pretty cool, and, and, and it, it's, it's amazing uh, the young people that are out there who do somehow get engaged with the idea that they're just allowed to make stuff. I think a lot of kids think that you go to college to learn how to do something so that then you can do it. And so that's why oh, wow. we come Permission. out at 22 being like, what? And we're lost. Uh, <laughs> we, need to, we need to make sure that people know that they're allowed to do stuff and make stuff when they're, when they're young. And then that's it's a challenge. And you saw that in Kane's Arcade, a father who was extremely permissive and okay. allowed his son to build this world in his, in his, uh, in his uh, garage. It's pretty amazing. I don't know if his father wasn't like that. The, the child would have been able to build that world. Absolutely. Next question. Anthony, you, uh, Rich Peranto here. Uh, Anthony, you talked early on, and several of you have mentioned uh, multiple times um, the motivation or demotivation of assessment. So you mentioned uh, the kid gets a grade of an F or whatever on a math test, and so they decide they're not good at math. And we talked about continuous assessment, teaching to the test, and all of that. Um, yet none of you have mentioned uh, what the, the students are learning in their sports experience. Um, and the sports experience is teamwork. Um, it's muscle memory, which is also something that hasn't been mentioned, but was also an important part of early gaming, although maybe not so much anymore. Um, and the fact that when the kids are doing sports, they're expected to fail and try again and learn and fail and try again. In fact, when you go to the competitions, 50% of the people in the audience are cheering for you to fail because they want the other team to win. Um, <laughs> And so how do we translate the experience, the, the positive experience that the students see in the athletic environment with, and the risk taking that goes with it, how do we get them in the regular curriculum or in the gaming world? Uh, I think the gaming world is much more analogous to the athletic world than it is to the, the um, regular educational world. How do we get them to be risk takers? How do we get them not to see that F as a demotivation? Um, and in fact, see that as a way to, uh, um, in some other way, to get them to motivate in their regular education. One last point has to do with the assessment, and this is uh, more for Linda. Um, I've been watching the Khan Academy, and I think a lot of people have, and I think one of the things that's interesting about the Khan Academy is the teacher um, continuous assessment feedback they get on what every student is doing every day uh, every little bit of what they're seeing in their in their education and their study and so I'm actually a proponent of continuous assessment because I think it does a better job of helping educators and family and parents support this failure and risk-taking and overcoming these obstacles which again is analogous to what we see in a lot of the games so comments on those we appreciate it well certainly I think um, well, I, I agree with your, your comment, and certainly sports, uh, you know, maybe I'm, I don't want to offend anyone, but sports are games as well. Um, you know, it's when we think about gamification or gameplay and game motivation, et cetera, I think that's part of it. Um, and certainly there's competencies and 21st century skills that are reinforced in a sport, sporting environment, teamwork, collaboration, uh, decision-making, leadership, et cetera, that are certainly applied to the learning environment that we want to try to drive in classrooms, but also to the outcomes that we consider workforce ready uh, that we're hiring for. So I agree that there's 
spillover between that. I think there's a closer par parallel between sports and game, game-based learning, gameplay, et cetera. Then there is traditional education, which is often content and assessment focused. And I think that model has got to change. I mean, in the reality of technology's landscape today, where ubiquitous access to the information uh, in a mobile phone, a mobile device exists for most learners today and will certainly exist in their workforce life, we have to not only ask a question, which a lot of what we're talking about and what we do in every day in schools is talk about how learning takes place. And we need to start asking what and why learning takes place more. So the reality that technology exists and search engines exist, et cetera, and we haven't fundamentally changed assessment at all, what we're teaching and what we're testing, is a ridiculous reality. That we should be asking different questions, expecting different things, and leveraging the, the, the knowledge base that exists in the palm of everyone's hands as an asset, not a liability. If you handed out a fourth grade test in any classroom in the United States today, the first thing a teacher would probably do is say, take out your, your laptops and put them on the floor, or turn off your cell phones, et cetera. And there's a fundamental conflict between assessment and technology that reflects both the weakness in terms of the advancement of assessment and really the, the lack of, uh, of evolution of technology's role. Technology has just been an automation of things we could do in a library or a phone call or a meeting room. And we've got to advance technology to become much more immersive and emotive like gameplay can do and shift the assessment to be much more focused on the development of skills that are much more workforce ready. So I agree with you on the sports piece and those, those are just things that we just have to involve to the classroom and the assessment models holistically. I would say an important thing about sport is, is this team aspect and that's one of the things that helps increase people's resiliency to failure is you have your teammates and you all see each other putting in that effort and you are motivated by that camaraderie and it also helps you take the sting out of some of that failure when it happens and so we see that not only in athletic sports but also in um, I, I recently watched my students compete in a robotics competition and I saw a lot of those same kind of team dynamics emerging where somebody would kind of rise to the occasion and perform much better than you could have thought that they would and, and, and also um, sort of reach out a hand of sportsmanship and a lot of these kind of characteristics and qualities that you want to see people have an opportunity to demonstrate, I think that team is, is a key component of it. And, there, and there's very, very few opportunities for students to act as a team in an academic context. Um, and, and so maybe something mm -hmm. that, that we could try to look for is more mm -hmm. opportunities to, to engage that, um, that, that team sportsmanship. Plus the fact that sports fans often teach themselves statistics. Absolutely. Right? I mean, I think that's kind of an impressive motivation story that we should seize hold of. Yeah. That's Absolutely. right. That's Absolutely true. That's a great point. Uh, in terms of the continuous assessment question, I, 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 I believe that it, um, I think it's powerful that personalized learning can happen via that continuous assessment. My one fear around, around the concept of kind of adaptive learning and uh, ongoing assessment is that the assessment takes over and, and the kind of immersive experience of just the learning is somehow forgotten. So I said a little bit earlier, data can be our friend. I think it can, can um, help to, to design what takes place next and it can be shared with parents and teachers. As long as it doesn't become the end goal and a kid doesn't become more focused on what that assessment is than what the learning is, then I think we're in good, good, um, in good shape. But there is, in the back of my mind as I watch this all evolving, I am concerned about that one element. Um, that yeah. it's, it becomes, mm -hmm. you know, kids now know um, what, their styles of learning, well, they could become knowledgeable about the way their learning is assessed, and is that really um, kind of a mindset we want them to be in all the time? Probably yeah. not. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think we are just about at time now. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for, first and foremost, for restoring my faith in technology and <laughs> gaming. Just a couple of steps up. A little bit? Just a little bit. <laughs> Definitely leveled up, and yeah, Karen's got some closing comments. A couple closing comments. Do so, Linda. Thank you very much, Ben, Anthony, Lucian. Congratulations on your 3.8 million dollar grant from AT&T today. Announced today. 
Thank you. Uh, Noah, thank you very much. And Tony for guiding the conversation. I think that I uh, hope everybody learned something and got some new ideas to add to your hopper. If you have other questions for the panelists, please feel free to send them to info at churchillclub.org and we'll make sure that we pass them along. As a small token of our appreciation, we have for you the much coveted Speaker Churchill Club t-shirt. Thank you. Please wear it in good health. Thank you again to Microsoft and of course the Luxembourg Trade and Investment Office. And thank all of you for coming. You've been a wonderful audience. Good night. Thanks.